So, um, good evening. I hope you've had a nice lunch. So, my name is um, Anastasis. Uh, it's a Greek name, it's a little bit weird, so just tolerate me for that. Uh, I work at CERN and um, I'm going to do something a little bit strange today. I'm not going to speak a lot about CERN. <laughs> We're going to speak about OpenStack most of the time. And um, I'm going also to tell you a little bit of my story, how things uh, started for me with OpenStack and how I first opposed to the problem about booting. I don't know if anybody of you had ever experienced problem uh, problems with uh, w when when they try to uh, to boot a very big infrastructure and you have a lot of requests at the same time. Anyone had problems scaling booting with glance? Okay, I hope I can give you an answer today for you. So um, when I first came uh, came at CERN, they told me that. I will work with OpenStack and uh, this specific machine here, which is quite amazing uh, kind of machinery. It's like more Star Wars stuff. So I was very, very excited about that. And when I first saw it, the, my first question was, OK, how many data this thing is producing? And I got my answer uh, pretty fast because they told me one of the remarkable things uh, about those machines is that they are producing a lot of data. And when I say a lot, I mean almost 40 terabytes per second, which is a tremendous big number. I mean, not at the scaling of any big company. I think not even Google can handle those big amounts of data. So my question again was, OK, so what do we do here? <laughs> I mean, how do we manage all these things? And this is uh, a pipeline of how we are able to do that. And in the very, very beginning, we are using electronics, FPGAs, and stuff like that to filter most of our data and reduce the 40 terabytes per second to almost uh, 300 gigabytes per second. And then we have, in the middle, you see, we have a complex of clusters to be able to do e even more filtering about the data. And then we propagate all the interesting uh, information that we found on, um, on a big a uh, network of computers, we call it the grid, which is a distributed, um, um, it's a distributed alliance, let's say, of a lot of data centers around the world. And the grid is where the analysis is taking place. So we have the filtering in our, uh, in our side, and then we propagate the interesting data to be analyzed uh, inside the grid. So um, to be able to filter uh, the amount of data, of course, we need a very strong complex, and this is the heart of this complex. We call it the HLT, the High Level Trigger, which is a, a big and very strong infrastructure, just by numbers. Uh, we have almost 1,300 nodes, and uh, almost 15,000 of uh, cores uh, on those machines, and a lot of RAM, and a lot of uh, disks. And just from perspective, there is a nice uh, benchmarking that uh, we use, at least in the physics world. We call it HEP spec 06. I don't know if anyone ever saw that benchmark. No. OK, one or two people. OK. So <coughs> our, uh, our cluster, it scores on 199.95K. Uh, and uh, just from the perspective, the tier 0 you see and all tier 1 are uh, the data centers around the world that combine together are helping uh, for the analysis. So only in our side we have a very very strong um, uh, we have a very very strong infrastructure to to do our job. And then my question was, okay, if we need so much uh, CPU intensive code to run our infrastructure, why do we need a cloud on top of that? And and I got a very nice email that had uh, that had no uh, notes, had no um, uh, words inside, not even a subject, and it was just this image. And this image was telling me that uh, if you see how uh, the lines are going, this is the amount of data we extract depending of the days. So there are some gaps between where this infrastructure is not working at all. So the idea was, let's do something to fill those gaps to be able to do something useful between the situation when we don't aggregate data, data from uh, the LHC. And this is why, um, this is why we, we built uh, uh, a cloud 
around that. This is why we needed OpenStack, because we had somehow to be able to serve this infrastructure to two completely different groups of people. Uh, on the one side, we have the people that they are aggregating the data, they are filtering the data, and on the other side, we have the people that they are analyzing the data. So using cloud and virtual, uh, and virtual machines was the best way to go. Those two people, uh, those two groups wouldn't interfere one to another. They are isolated, and um, they could both work uh, very nicely. So we set it up uh, Grizzly, OpenStack, back then. Uh, two years ago, and uh, we could only deploy the basic services, all the needed services like um, Nova, Glance, Bekeystone, and the Nova APIs around. And the reason is that we didn't want to interfere too much with the infrastructure, because for those key services, we had to dedicate machines on that. We had to, to extract them from their main purpose to run on the uh, data filtering, and they would be dedicated only to the cloud. So we, we, we were not allowed to use that many dedicated machines. And we also uh, wanted, we wanted to be sure but that everything works properly. And we use Chorusing for that. And all the other services like RabbitMQ and MariaDB, they're working in a failover mode. But also the reason that we used all these uh, services uh, with a lot of uh, instances is not only to be sure that everything works and to be redundant is also about scaling and when you have and when you have a lot of requests and you want massively to boot all your infrastructure at the less time as possible you need somehow to handle all these requests because as i said this is a cloud that is running in in only some hours and you have to not spend time on starting your um, uh, starting your virtual machines or spending too much time on things that they are not about computing. So just in one minute, you will have a great amount of requests to boot up everything. So you need to handle that. The schedulers, the APIs, everything must be in multiple instances so all these requests can be propagated correctly. So we ended up in a situation like this one. On uh, the first uh, side, you can see just four controllers. These are our special machines that we have our core services there. And um, on the middle, we have uh, the GLAN service uh, with uh, two instances, the MariaDB, which is dedicated, uh, a small, a small dedicated cluster with uh, three machines. And on the, all the other remaining machines are just the Nova uh, hypervisors, nothing else. They, they just uh, have the virtual machines there. Also about the networking. Uh, uh, all of our machines, they have only one gigabps link because what we care the most is uh, the, uh, the computation and not that much the network traffic. So they have regular ethernets with one gigabps link and they are connected to two networks. So on the, one, on the downside, we have the network that all the information for OpenStack are passing through. And on the other side is where the virtual machines are connected to the outside world to communicate with the internet or whatever other needs are necessary. So when we booted and we did our first tests, we ended up in a case like this one. So on the left side, you see the number of the virtual machines that they are booted every minute. And on the x-axis is uh, are the minutes. So when we asked for uh, when we asked for almost 400 machines to boot instantly, we had to wait almost two hours to have it done. So it wasn't a very good uh, demo. <laughs> and this is where we start actually thinking what's what's the problem, what what's going on behind, and how we can solve it. Of course, uh, the problem is the massive booting, nothing else, and the major problem is how you propagate your images to the, uh, to the virtual machines. So we made a small list about what should be our uh, target and uh, how we can solve uh, the problems one by one. So there is a trick in this whole story, which is the Nova CAS, um, which is where the Nova, when, when you ask for an image, Nova is storing your image if you want to reuse it for later on. 
But the problem was with us that this image is changing frequently. So on the one hand, we were very happy that we found that. On the other side, it was very helpful. So networking, again, a bottleneck for the same again situation. Maybe one or two runs would be OK, but one or two, three days, uh, because we could use the same, uh, the same image. But afterwards, you have to change it again. And maybe you will lose your whole day just waiting to propagate your images. And also, as I said again, we are not very allowed to play with a lot of different tools to do what we want to do. So the first thing we thought it was, OK, let's revise, let's review a little bit what, what booting is and how OpenStack is working. This is a very simplistic approach, of course. S I'm sorry for my graphics. I'm not you know, very special on that. And on the very left side, we have the request that we have a regular user asking for a virtual machine. Then the, the request is going through the API, standard uh, way to do it. Then you have your scheduler where um, some nice magic is, uh, magic is uh, taking place. Your hypervisor is picked correctly with filters you add and stuff like that. When uh, Nova is being picked and you know where your supervisor is, the Nova is communicating with Glance and ask for the image to be served. And then you have your virtual machine. So that, that was the whole idea. From my perspective, this is a very nice diagram. I think this is the correct way to do it when you have distributed systems. I don't know if someone disagrees or agrees with me, but I think it's, it's the obvious at least way to do it. The question here is what happens if you have a lot of requests? And uh, if you have a lot of users and a lot of user machines that must be booted at the same time. So the situation becomes something like this. And uh, I changed a little bit the colors you know, to be more obvious. So the API, because it's quite a simple role to play, well, not, not very easy, but still easier than the scheduler, um, it should be loaded, but not that much. Then you have your scheduler that is going to play a bigger role because you have to communicate with the database, pick the right hypervisors, run some queries underneath to, to pick your um, hypervisors. So it's going to be much more loaded. And this is why we have it on uh, four instances in our case. And then you have your hypervisors. But your hypervisors are distributed by definition. So no big change there. Whatever had to do in one request, they have to do the same for 1,000 requests. On the other side, you have Glance that is going to kneel from this whole uh, workload because it has to serve simultaneously however requests you have. So this is not really working if you have just, of course, one instance of Glance, not something, uh, not a distributed system to do it something different. This is just, you know, the simple approach. So I think that you would agree with me that boot makes time, and this is why we had the diagram that was linear almost. We had to serially, serially uh, serve the images one by one. And um, in our case, that we run in a shared infrastructure, this is a tremendous big problem. I mean, we have to solve that. And I think that you will agree that it's not only us that we, ser uh, that we have in, uh, that, that we run a shared infrastructure, but I think even big companies that uh, they want to serve uh, virtual machines to their users, they don't want to spend time on waiting for the virtual machine to boot, because this is you know, time spent, time is money, and so on. Of course, there are solutions for that problem. The obvious ones, uh, having a distributed file system. I mean, I think this is the way that most of the people are um, dealing with, it, uh, with this problem. Uh, the other is if you use an object storage like uh, Swift. Again, that was uh, the recommended, at least, uh, solution some time back. And well, the obvious and simple solution for students like me, at least, is, OK, let's have a lot of uh, glances everywhere. And let's boot from there. But it's not that simple to do that. This needs a fair amount of complexity to actually be able to handle all that. And OK, maybe a lot of uh, glance instances is not that a big deal. Uh, but working with Ceph or working with uh, other uh, distributed file system of object storages, is, it needs quite an amount of knowledge and uh, sysadmin skills to be able to organize all this stuff. And also, for if you have a lot of glances on the other side, you need somehow to invent your own way to handle and sync all of them together. Because if you add one image on one, 
you need somehow to propagate these changes to the others. So we need you, you need to do something. Um, and again, just to be sure that we are on the same page, uh, we have a massive infrastructure, short time to go to, to boot everything, to be able to, to give uh, CPU power to our users. But on the other hand, we have very li limited permissions and very little manpower, actually, to, to do all this stuff. So the question arises and is, how can we improve it? How, how can we exploit the Nova CAS in our uh, advantage? Because it's, it's a nice feature. Uh, how maybe can we reduce the image size somehow? And of course, the biggest question of all is, how can we distribute it in a better way without too much overhead of uh, our administration? So our answers on that were starting from uh, top to bottom. For the Nova CAS, we said that, that we said that if we know the image that we want to serve, we can just push it there before the request comes uh, before the request comes through. So this is a little bit the case like uh, big organizations that they have um, a notion they call it uh, golden images. I don't know if anyone heard about that. So when you have an image that is very very common and you know a lot of of your users they are going to use it, you just drop it there by default. So when a request comes, nothing of all this is needed. Your, bo your, uh, your machine is just booted up instantly. Uh, for the image size, uh, we said that we had some problems there because we're not really sure for what kind of image we're going to get from our users because the users are a completely different organization out of our scope. We're just serving them. So we said, can we compress the image? And I'm going to give you some really nice um, numbers later on about the compression. And the last thing is that how we are going to distribute uh, the image. And we said the simple, uh, the simple thing to do is maybe we could use some regular HTTP proxies, Squid. I don't know, you know Squid? Heard about that? Uh, it's a very old fashioned way to, to do HTTP things, at least before NAT. So we said we have some proxies around. Maybe can we explode them in our need to be faster on the distribution? So our first test was something like this. We said, OK, we're going to set up an HTTP server, a regular Apache server on the GLAN side. So whenever you have a user that is adding a new uh, image on, your, uh, on, on their behalf, we're going to take that. We're going to add it on this Apache server. Of course, we're going to pr uh, we're going to compress it, and then we are going to set up four Squid servers on those special machines we have. Maybe even more because, as I said, we have uh, some other extra machines that are dedicated to our needs. And then the only thing that we need to do is actually go to the machines. We already know the image that we want to precast, and let's just initialize a widget, and magically, yeah, it works. <laughs> So this is a little bit more about the workflow, how actually it works. Uh, you have your, uh, your user that is adding the new image on Glance, regular, nothing changed. I mean, uh, the users, they never understand what's, uh, what's going on in this uh, case. They, uh, we have a cron behind that is just checking the file system, very simple stuff. And uh, we take the image, we compress it, we gzip, regular stuff again. We save it on the regular. <laughs> Uh, folder of uh, Apache server, and we Apache server just magically sees it. And on the other side, we have the Nova compute. We initialize a widget, and the way that we do that is, uh, in our case, M Collective. You know, the M Collective is a distributed tool to propagate commands. So we just initialize it, uh, initialize it with one command: "Please fetch my image everywhere." And uh, the widget is being initialized. We get the image, we uncompress it on the fly, and I'm going to go a little bit more into that. We store it on a temporary uh, Im uh, on a temporary folder because this may react li a little bit strange with Nova. And when the image is ready, we go we we just copy it inside uh, the Nova CAS. Some black magic about SHJ one naming stuff about uh, Nova, and everything works as should be. As I said, and one interesting thing is about compressing. And um, what we used, it was 
just the regular gzip command. Take the image, compress it, and it's really interesting just to look at the first line, the size. We, f we had an image that was 1.3 gigabytes. This is one of our examples. Um, not the best one, but not the worst one. <laughs> um, and only by compressing with the gzip is going from 1.3 gigabytes to almost 400 megabytes, which is uh, divided by four. It's a big gain. What is also is interesting is that we tried some other ways to compress it. What if someone wants to do the same thing should also uh, should always think about the ratio between zip time and unzip time, because the zip time is something that you sh you shouldn't care that much how long you should take because it's only it's paid only once. On the other hand, the unzip time is paid from every Nova compute. So you must be sure that your unzip time is really fast if you have a problem uh, if you have a problem with your networking. On the other hand, if you have very fast uh, networking and you are okay with the propagation, maybe you can go in either, uh, even uh, bigger numbers and win a little bit from the size. So it depends. You have to, to find your use case on that. So from only f from uh, from the example we had by this, we tried to play again. And can someone imagine what was the result? It was instant. <laughs> right. Of course, I'm cheating a little bit here because I'm not telling you how much time we needed to propagate the image, but I'm not actually cheating because the propagation time was just the first line that is done. So the propagation time was only some minutes, and then we got the request, and everything booted instantly because it's the everything started from from CAS, from the CAS. We also uh, tried the same. Um, we also tried to measure the amount of time we need for a bigger installation, and uh, this is an example about uh, almost 1,000 machines, more or less. And this is the time you need only to propagate the image, not to boot, because we don't really care. It's instant, so I don't include it on this diagram. It's only to give the command to the M collective to give me, uh, give me the image on uh, the Nova. And in the very, very beginning, you see that we have some, uh, some uh, sorry, this is in seconds, not in minutes. So we have some seconds that nothing happening because the images have been propagated from the glance itself to the squid services. So you need some time, all your squid services, to be sure that they have uh, the image cast. And then when they have it, they start you know, giving it also to, to the next, uh, to, to, to the servers. One more trick that we did, uh, it was, you know, it's not, ev everything here is not ideal. A squid is not made actually to do things like that. It needs some proper configuration to be able to do it. Um, so when we actually do a widget on, uh, f from our uh, hypervisors, we add a small random delay. So not all of the hypervisors simultaneously start asking for the same image. But this delay is uh, between seconds. Uh, if I remember correctly, it's between uh, sorry, 0 to 20 seconds. So it, it's getting by random to do that. So the last numbers that we, we we gathered about all our infrastructure in our case was if you go with you know, the dumb way, just the normal stuff, one glance that is serving all your infrastructure, and if you want to do a massive boot, because if you have one glance server and you have sparsely situations like that, maybe it works really nicely, but if you want to do a massive boot, no. So in the first case, we have uh, with no squid and without compression, and we are almost to four hours with 1,200 machines. If we go only with compression, just by compressing your, um, our image, we go from almost to four hours to one hour, which is a big difference only by adding one feature. On the other side, if we don't have a compression and go with only with a squid, we see we have half an hour. So only by car taking care of your network, this is the big uh, the big deal, to, to do the networking correctly, to be able to propagate your image. And of course, if you add both tricks, you go in less than 10 minutes, as the title at least uh, suggests. So that was something that shocked us a lot on uh, how you can 
do simple stuff with simple tools because Quid and some Apache Server and one uh, command in, uh, in M Collective, it, ga it gain us a lot of time to be able to, to serve our users. So we came up with some suggestions on how we would like to see from the community back and what we would expect to, to be done. And the first thing is that um, maybe Nova should think to support arbitrary proxies. They already uh, rely on, um, on, on regular HTTP requests to, to get your, your images from Glance. And it would be nice just to have one parameter in the config file, please take this through this proxy. I mean, it would be quite easy, I think, to, to be done. And also would serve some purposes, at least in our case. And also, the nice thing about proxy is that you reuse uh, known technology to a lot of uh, at least old administrators. And you can play a lot with the topologies. You can have multiple levels of your squids to do your magic. And uh, the good thing is that your whole propagation is going through a tree. So instead of having you know n things to serve, you have actually log n steps to, to go through, which is it's a big speed up. On the other hand, uh, we would like to see the compression. Just uh, even, even if not the user be able to do that, maybe the, uh, the administrator would be able to configure the glance to store uh, the images compressed. Because not of all the users, they use the uh, uh, correct formats to do things like that. Because maybe you have a user that is just storing a raw image. So why you should be bothered to, to, st to store all this? Maybe you can just compress it and know, take some megabytes back from that. So again, the workflow nearby about how we were thinking to do that. Uh, by the way, do we have uh, people that they are uh, from the Nova side, that they are committers there? <laughs> no. OK. Because uh, this idea about the image compression was suggested during the Google Summer of Code last summer. And uh, well, it was not accepted. so. I'll just know. <laughs> um, another idea that came up uh, that is not exactly in our case, but still interesting to be um, explored, it would be if Nova uh, was able to, uh, to be aware of uh, its CAS. And when I say aware, what we were thinking is, th is this. When a user asks for a VM and the, v uh, the image is cast in one hypervisor, and then the, the, the VM has been destroyed. When you ask again for the same image, there is a probability that uh, the request is going to go to the same hypervisor. So why not reuse the same hypervisor that the image is already cast inside and do the things much, much faster? So we're thinking something like this. You have Nova that is reporting back to database. And I don't know if you are aware about uh, regular OpenStack scheduler filters that they pretty much do the same thing. They just have all the information about your um, hypervisors, and they are filtering on some attributes. So we just want to add one more attribute about which image I have. So when the request comes to the scheduler, we would be able to understand what's going on. So about the conclusion for all these things, um, we are very happy that we actually made it work. And uh, I think more happy are the physicists on the other side. Also, if someone was in the first day and saw the uh, presentation about CERN, the, phys are the physicists are quite demanding people. So from our m for, from four hours that we, uh, our dummy example was uh, needed to do, the, to, do, to, do, to do the work, we just need uh, 10 minutes to do that now right now. And I think the biggest uh, point here is that we did all this dark magic and all this hack with uh, solid technologies. It's not all custom-made, custom scripts that has to be rewritten from scratch. We, uh, we, we use solid technologies to do that. I think this was the, the best uh, thing. And what we think is that there is even more space for improvement. And there are some corner cases like ours that can be uh, easily fitted in the community because I think not all of you have the same problem as we have. I think no one knows the whole infrastructure to be booted 
at once. But even if we have a little bit uh, exotic needs, it's not very hard to be uh, to be fixed and to be able uh, we to be able to to satisfy them. So, any questions? <coughs> Sorry. Yep, yep, uh, that was uh, one other thing that I wanted to add in my <laughs> presentation, but my supervisor didn't want to. <laughs> um, so, yeah, uh, we were thinking to, to do this with uh, torrents, and uh, actually it's a remarkable idea, in my opinion. The problem is it's really hard to do it. You, you need, uh, uh, you need to, to think a lot of things about the topology of your infrastructure because everything has to pass some, uh, some routers, routers sorry. so you need to know where, where are your racks, you need to know a lot of stuff. So it's a little bit hard how you're going to do it and the worst thing is how you're going to give it to the users to be able to, to manage that. But I totally agree that with a little bit of work this can be done and it should be really, really nice. So when we actually booted all this stuff, it was some versions ago. So in Grizzly, all this stuff are not supported. And also, I'm, um, I think this uh, is not actually pre-cassing in the very uh, new versions. I think it's about you able to cast the image on the glance side. So you still have to redistribute it some way. And if your bottleneck is on glance, you still have the same thing. Also, the new glands, uh, they, they, if I remember correctly, they start doing a middleware. So I'm not really um, professional about, uh, professional about the, the gland side. Um, they have a middleware to take care about all these things, but still not supporting our version. So somehow we had to hack all this way back. The good thing about this you know, dirty hack, let's say, is that it's supported in any kind of version because it's completely external to, to OpenStack. Sorry, I didn't hear you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. This was just you know a simple illustration about how you can win only by doing a very simple compression. Uh, you can even use not streaming algorithms. You can go even you know to more sophisticated compression in the very end and have even bigger gains on what you need. So it depends on your case. It was okay for us. We said. Okay, just zip it. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah. Um, can you no, no, just no. I squid was working. <laughs> it was fine. <laughs> No, 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 it's um, uh, when um, most of the times it's working manually because uh, when the user is actually, uh, when I say manually, when the user is inserting the image, you know more or less how much time you want to start the propagation. So you give a small time window between those cases and you say, okay, now this is cast, go on, take the, take the image. Any more? Okay. So thank you very much.